Thank you, Mark. Thanks to all of the panel, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I consider economic opportunity and mobility to be really one of the most important issues facing the country right now, and it's something that we're following incredibly closely at the magazine, um, and I feel very lucky to be discussing it with all of you today. Um, just to say a couple of words to start, mobility and opportunity is traditionally uh, an economic competitive advantage for this country. We've always had a great level of mobility uh, historically compared to Europe, for example. But as we know, and as we reported last year, that's starting to change, and that is a real worry. Uh, we have a youth unemployment crisis right now, as, as all of you know so well. Um, but there is good news, too. There are jobs being created. There are 14 million new jobs that are going to be created in the next 10 years. But they are jobs that will require a certain level of training, often a community college degree, and better alignment of the needs of employers with the educational system. Um, so we're here to talk about these things and, and many other things today. I've been told I have 20 minutes, but I may go rogue and make it 22. We'll see. Um, so everyone <laughs> speak, speak succinctly and, and draw out the color in your stories. And I'm going to start with um, a question for a couple of you, Jeff and Stacy, just to start, because you're working with some of the most vulnerable populations, and I want to hear a little bit about the way in which you're working with high school dropouts and these very vulnerable kids to get them back on the track and reintegrate them. And if you want to share some of your stories and your, your most colorful examples of how that's working, that would be great. Great, great. Um, it's wonderful to have the opportunity. I'd just like to credit Mark and his team for this wonderful plan. Uh, I think the work we're doing is really connected to the piece on creating action communities. Um, the idea being is that uh, essentially assuming that we can address the dropout issue with the education system alone is quite simply flawed. Uh, the, the idea of the Little Red Schoolhouse being the sole owner of educational excellence is long past. And really everybody in this room, everybody in a community shares some of the responsibility. Um, and our historical definition of collaboration, as we've defined it, uh, as one community member that we, we worked with said, it, it sort of just feels like a kumbaya circle, um, as opposed to something really purposeful. And in essence, it's led to what we call spray and pray, where you're spraying resources all over the place, and you're praying that really good things happen. Uh, and what we've got to start doing, and what we were able to do in Cincinnati, and we're continuing now to do with over uh, 60 communities across the country, is figure out how to bring together all these cross-sector leaders from the education, business, nonprofit, philanthropic, and civ uh, civic sectors to build what we call the cradle-to-career civic infrastructure. Uh, and this is essentially a way to have what many are calling collective impact. Uh, but the bottom line idea is, is if you can bring all these key leaders together who have their finger on resources to start agreeing on a common vision, and that's great, but more importantly, agreeing on some outcomes they want to move. So outcomes like, are we re-engaging youth that are already out to make sure that they don't just get back into school of some sort, but they actually succeed once they get there and get placed in some form of employment? Are we actually doing that? And then not just investing in every great idea, but actually looking at their local data and saying, what is working right now in our hometown that we could lift up and do more of? Uh, and that's probably a great opportunity to pass it on uh, to the great work with that, uh, that Project U-Turn is doing. But the idea would be is that in every community, there are things like this that we can lift up and sometimes pull in. And our belief is if you pull all these leaders together and begin to identify those initiatives, you can begin to actually build your own civic infrastructure right in your own backyard. Okay, Stacey, you pick it up from there. Um, thanks, Jeff. So Project U-Turn is Philadelphia's response to how we are going to solve the dropout crisis. And the way that we do that is based on a basic belief. We believe all young people can succeed, both economically and educationally. So this is a cross-sector collaborative that actually is comprised of our local leaders and city government, our philanthropic community, our employer community, educational community, and our social service and nonprofit community. And through that belief, we basically looked at four things. We looked at one, the data. Who are our young people? Can we tell the truth about them? And understanding and digging deep into your data is, is critical. Second is, once you understand who your young people are, what types of services do they need? What's the infrastructure, as Jeff talked about? So we looked at our educational system and realized that we did not have enough opportunities that matched the needs of our young people. So we needed to build seats. We needed to create new high schools and new um, out of school time opportunities. The third is how do you keep youth voice at the center? 
Kids are our clients, and at the end of the day, they're gonna be our future. If we don't figure out a way to hear from them and build interventions that meet their need, then at the end of the day, we will have missed the boat. And the third is, the fourth is how do you align and leverage the money that already exists? How do you take those investors and then figure out a new way to use that money and create an entire systemic process? So we're six years in and we've seen an increase in our high school graduation rate from 48% to 61%. We've created 5,000 new educational seats. <laughs> Um, and I believe one of our young people is, is speaking on a panel, Ramin, um, in the afternoon, who's going to tell his story about in our multiple pathway system. But Project U-Turn really has been, I think, a phenomenal transformation agenda. Okay. Well, I love the idea of kids as clients. That's a great phrase to keep in mind. And I'm really interested in what both of you were saying about mismatches, because as we know, the mismatch between skills uh, and jobs that are available is, is a big part of what's been happening in this story of the, the downturn and the recovery. Some economists believe that as much as uh, two-thirds of unemployment is a result of that mismatch. So there's a, a number of folks here that can speak to that, and I want to invite you, uh, Stan, uh, Bob, and Diana, because you're at the intersection, all of you, between bringing together educators and job creators. And uh, since Stan is sitting next to me and, and I know a little bit about P-TECH, why don't you start, and then Bob and Diana, I want to hear from you as well on this. Well, I think that the idea of uh, changing the uh, construct of high school and community college in America is right at the core of the problem that you outlined. If there are going to be 14 million jobs over a 10-year period, that's great. And if you look at our community college two-year completion rates overall at 25%, and you look at the skill deficiencies that kids who have high school diplomas have, we obviously need some game-changing activities that are going to really create a new opportunity and part of that is going to involve getting business higher education and our school leaders together community by community to forge different collaboratives the thing that we did starting in new york city the p-tech program which has been referred to earlier is a six-year program every student completes with both a high school diploma and an associate's degree in computer science or applied sciences and first in line for jobs at IBM, which is a powerful incentive. But if you went to the school and you went into the classrooms, you'd see the students being educated with their core skills matched up to the entry-level skill requirements for jobs in the industry. So what would be going on in the classroom would be very different from what would be experienced in a normal classroom. And if you look at this school in Brooklyn, uh, in a tough neighborhood with no special admission criteria, no special charter school rules or regulations. At the end of the first year, very high attendance, very high completion rates, and the students already taking uh, college courses in the 10th grade, and doing better than your normal student would do with a high school diploma. So that's the new way of thinking, creating a new opportunity. But we can't just wave a magic wand and imagine that it's going to happen. We actually have to do things differently, and that's what this lesson is about. And I think it connects directly to the Opportunity Nation agenda of reforming Perkins Act money to incent schools uh, to be able to provide connections to labor market information so that their uh, training is for real jobs and real careers, uh, getting higher education and business to the table in a substantive way and providing a real bright future for larger and no larger numbers of young people. And that's how we take advantage of those 14 million jobs and make the U.S. competitive. Okay. I've been in this school, actually, and I will just say that the energy is incredible. And uh, technologically, in particular, these kids are way ahead of me, I will just say. <laughs> um, so, Bob, um, I know that you've dealt with these same paradigms. You've written the Pathways to Prosperity report. Do you agree with what Stan's just said? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, actually, um, I just want to make two comments, uh, both pivoting off of stands. I think one of the things that's different about this era from earlier uh, efforts to really engage employers with schools in a more collaborative and effective way is I think at this point in the economy, we have in the healthcare sector, in the uh, information technology, in advanced manufacturing, you've got employers who are genuinely worried about their future workforce. And that's the motivation that you really want to tap into. It's enlightened economic self-interest um, is the, more, the most 
powerful lever to really get, bring employers to the table and, and keep them there. PTEC, in my mind, builds off of, it's a natural kind of extension of the experience from two very powerful models that we now have a, a lot of experience with. One is the career academy model, that high school reform model that mixes strong academics and strong career and technical uh, education with a focus. There are probably 6,000 of these or so around the country. The National Academy Foundation, I think of as the kind of gold standard here, uh, it runs about 500 of these. It's been in business 30 years. It has very strong data to support the argument that if you really can <coughs> combine these two things, a strong academic foundation with a strong technical and career focus, you can give kids at least some opportunities for paid internships while they're in school. You can really motivate them to stay in school, complete, and go on to higher education. The other national network, uh, which is now about 10 years old, was actually launched with some seed money from the Gates Foundation. Uh, this is the early college high school model. And that's a model that basically says um, the best way to get to ensure that kids are really prepared for and ready for higher education is to get them started on post-secondary education while they're still in high school. There are 270 um, early college high schools around the country in this national network that's coordinated by Jobs for the Future, a Boston-based uh, nonprofit. More than half of the class of, two, of 2011 is completing high school with two years of college credit. This may be a nice segue to Diana because um, <laughs> Texas is one of the states that really has embraced the uh, ECHS model and I think uh, has really provided some, some national examples worth studying here. Okay, great. Diana, tell us what's happening at UT. Well, first, I, th I think it's important to recognize that a public university like ours located in the U.S.-Mexico border region um, has to think very hard about its role and mission and how it's going to serve the people of that region. That's what public universities are supposed to do. And so uh, many years ago when I became president, one of the things that we did was to take a look at who we were and whom we served and whom we didn't serve. And we began to understand through data and careful analysis that we were increasingly out of sync with the demographics of the region. And so we set off on a quest to form a partnership with the school districts from which we draw approximately 80% of our students and the El Paso Community College, which is the only two-year institution in our region. And we formed something called the El Paso Collaborative for Academic Excellence, which was an effort to raise aspirations and educational attainment among all young people in the region. Far too many young people were told over and over again that they weren't college material. And so we were squandering huge amounts of talent on very weak grounds. And so we began this collaborative. We worked with teachers. We had a lot of wonderful support from foundations, from the National Science Foundation and others. And it does take partners. We all have to work together. Um, and we have now a student demographic that absolutely mirrors uh, the demographic of the region we serve. And I consider that to be, frankly, one of the best outcomes that we could have hoped for. So we're now 77% Hispanic, and we look like El Paso, which is what a public university in a region like ours should. Um, the early college high schools, to that point, um, have been an extension of those partnerships. So we have six early college high schools in the El Paso area and UTEP is enrolling uh, graduates of these high schools who come with not only their high school diplomas, but their associate's degrees. And these are speedsters. These students move along very fast. Some of them actually finish their associate's degree before they complete their high school diploma. <laughs> so they come to us at the end of the junior year, and uh, at the end of their junior year in high school, and their juniors at UTEP at the same time, they finish their senior year in high school and their degree at UTEP within the next year or year and a half. And it's quite an amazing accomplishment. What's really interesting are the policy implications of a lot of these things. These speedster students, these accelerated students, can't get federal financial aid to come early to UTEP if they finish their associate's degree at the end of the junior year because they haven't graduated from high school. <laughs> and so we have to figure out ways to get the policy framework to be more supportive. Let me just say one other thing because the partnership with uh, the business sector has been hugely important for us. 
We are an engineering and science school. At our founding, we were a mining school, so we produce more Hispanic engineers than almost any university in the country. And we've been discovered by companies that have this workforce concern that we talked about a moment ago, and they know that their future workforce depends on institutions like ours. And so we've had companies like IBM and many others that have partnered with us over the years to try to build capacity and to encourage more young people uh, to pursue careers, particularly in STEM. So it, it takes not only a village, it takes a country. It's amazing. All right, well, we're going to... I want to come back to that, but I want to turn for a moment uh, from education to the idea of on-the-job training and what that looks like. And Gail, I know that you guys at The Gap have done a tremendous amount with that. Tell us a little bit about how it works, and also tell us about the soft skills uh, that the kids are learning, because I think that that's really important, the idea of, of training these kids in these skills that some people, you know, sort of get in the air that they breathe, but not everyone does. Right. I'm going to steal a phrase I heard this morning uh, for the first time from Bronca Minnick. She said, we hire for hard skills, we fire for soft skills. So clearly soft skills are super important. That's a really great way that employers can get involved. Of course, if companies have entry-level jobs, great, set up internships, set up learn and earn programs. But for those employers that don't have those kinds of programs, that's a big part of what we were thinking about in creating the uh, toolkit, the White House Council for Community Solutions Toolkit, that guides employers on one of three pathways for supporting youth. The first is around soft skills, the second is around work-ready skills, and the third is the creation of learn and earn programs. If you haven't seen the website, I'll check it out. Um, it's a great way, especially for companies that have very strong volunteer programs. I'm, I'm sure a lot of the uh, the employers that are in the room come from companies where increasingly that's just part of, of what we do in corporate America nowadays. And it's something that is so valuable that we can build into those kind of employee volunteer programs. Okay, great. Well, we have three minutes, although I may make it five, um, <laughs> as I threatened in the beginning. I want to go down the row here and have everyone very quickly say what you would need to do to take the ideas and the successes that you've had in your organizations, in your institutions, and take that national. What do you need? Well, I would say first you need the uh, combined collaborative power of business, higher education, uh, the people in K-12, and the people in the civic community to change how we do business. Uh, the Opportunity Nation agenda was to change how we sustain and support career and technical education in the country to create incentives that connect the kind of training that people do to the jobs that are out there, get business involved in a really meaningful way. Volunteer opportunities are great, but we need to fix the curriculum so that kids are engaged and energized uh, to change how they learn. Uh, thank you. And I think some of the things that were identified don't require an act of Congress, and they don't require a change in our federal budgets or state budgets. They require a real commitment to doing things differently. In the United States, it wasn't until after the Second World War that high school was mandatory. Before that, it was optional. We made a big change in this country, and you could argue that that made a big change in the U.S. economy in the 20th century. Now is an opportunity to make a big change in the 21st century. Well put. Gail? I think we need to change the units of time we think about. We're really focused on today and tomorrow and mm. this year, and if we can shift the time mm. frame, um, we have to worry about five years from now, ten years from now, and I think that's a big part of what corporate America and thinking about future employees and future co customers. At a company like Gap Inc., we need customers that are going to want to continue to have, uh, that they need money in their pockets to buy those jeans and t-shirts. Um, so they need jobs, and we need to shift our thinking about time frames. I love that, taking a long view. So important on any number of levels. Stacey. I would say two things. Political will. We have to be willing to change our policies. We create disengaged students. They're not born. So we have to change those policies in our educational agenda. <laughs> And the second thing is we need financial will. We need the investors that are interested in this topic to support a long view of solutions within local communities. Okay. You're here. 
So building on that, I think it's, it's it, it, part of the shift in the, to get to the long view and to get to this different financial uh, perspective is to, is to totally shift from a charitable mentality to an investment mentality, to say that, to say that every, to, to say that the success of every child is directly linked to our success uh, economically and our success as a nation. And possibly the least sexy answer uh, in getting us to this investment mentality would be to say that we actually need comprehensive data management systems. We need to really understand we need to have the data on what students really need, where they are right now, so that all the services that we may have in our community already or the great opportunities that exist outside our community can actually be targeted to what a child needs, not what we think they need. Uh, so getting to that point is going to be critical. In uh, 2010, I had the opportunity to take part uh, in a 17-country study. Um, called Learning for Jobs. This was done by OECD, and it looked at how other countries managed to build pathways that move the majority of the young people from high school with post-secondary education and training and on into the, the workforce. Um, two themes uh, really struck me and we built into our Pathways to Prosperity report. Uh, one, and perhaps the most important, is the countries that do this well don't simply think about this as helping kids make the transition from school to work. They think of it in broader social and developmental terms, helping all young people make a successful transition from adolescence to adulthood with lots of community support. The second related point is, uh, that we called for in our report is to really create a kind of public social compact, if you will, between the larger adult society and young people. So young people, all young people can see a visible opportunity structure in front of them. They can see the potential for support, but they also get the message they need to really pitch in and do their part in order to, to realize their uh, potential. Okay. Diane? I think uh, it's very hard to be last, by the way, because all <laughs> the really good ideas I had in my head are, are articulated so well. But I, I do think that uh, changing attitudes about the enterprise that we're all engaged in here is extraordinarily important. I think the media have a huge role to play in this. And it is not only about creating access and offering students a pathway, but it's also ensuring that whatever it is that we do to provide them with opportunities is of the highest quality. Because one of the big concerns that I have now is that as we look at jobs and workforce training, there's a tendency to segment that mm -hmm. away from what I would consider to be excellence. These young people, for the most part, are just as talented as, for the most part, are those in more affluent settings. And so what we must do is to ensure that we give them every opportunity to compete at the highest level. And that means going on to graduate school or professional school. That means doing all the things that they have every right to expect. Okay, well that's great stuff from all of you. It's been a very short panel, but we have taken the long view, I think. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank you all for being here, and thanks for having us.